Yeah, g'day. My name's Mark, and welcome to this, my old lathe channel. Now, I own three lathes, but since I got this 1980s Shaw Blend CNC lathe up and running, I haven't really been using the other two. And since I really need the space, I think it's time that I sell my 1970s, probably, Bolly 4LV lathe. But before I sell it, let's do a review on it. G. Bolly was one of the big German lathe manufacturers. I think they started off with watchmaking lathes and slowly got bigger. And this size 4L was probably their most popular model. I got it because it's kind of a perfect hobby size lathe with about 400 millimeters between centers. It can swing about 240 millimeters over the bed and about 140 over the cross slide. The electrics are about as simple as it gets. Three phase in, bunch of fuses, main switch, and then off to the motor and the light, which leaves plenty of space in the electrical cabinet if you want to add an electronic lead screw. There's a main switch with a non-functioning light. Because I never switched this machine light directly here, the light being on means the machine's on. The main spindle control being this very funky old switch here up behind the tailstock. It's a Dahlander motor, so you've got two speeds, low and high. In forward and in reverse, you just have high. Obviously machines of this era don't meet modern electrical wiring codes. Like if you start with the machine off, but have the spindle in an on position, Turning on the machine will automatically start the spindle. So if you're going to use this industrially, you'd have to get a Sparky to add some protection to it. So its main motor is about 0.9 of a kilowatt. So what's that? About 1.2, 1.3 horsepower. I didn't consider putting a VFD on it because I got three phase here, but it would be easy enough to run it on single phase through a VFD. You can see from the speed range chart your different options. Coming in from the two sides, from the motor you've got two different pulley gear ratios. The speed change here is done by loosening off those two, slackening off the tension by cranking that down and then moving the belt over. I normally have it in high speed mode for most of the time, but for specific jobs I will flick it over. The next thing you got here is A being these three stepped pulleys. Now if the machine had the optional lever for switching between the three final pulley drive stages, it would be located here, but this one didn't have it. I mean, to switch these over is not that difficult. You just sort of push the belt across and B is the back gear with the back gear out for high speed or engage for low speed and then D here is the electrical switching between high speed and low speed windings on the motor and it gives you a pretty nice wide speed range the headstock also has a spindle lock just to lock the spindle to enable you to unscrew a chuck one kind of nice safety feature is if you have that spindle lock engaged and by mistake turn on the spindle the belt just jumps off its uh, lower pulley so you don't get any damage. The spindle itself runs in a conical adjustable plane bearing at the front and at the back if I remember rightly it's a roller bearing. I did have it out and scraped in that bearing a few years ago. There's a thread on madmodder.net if you type in Bolly, you'll find it where I scraped in that, uh, that spindle bearing. That front bearing's got a little oiler and it gets oiled with uh, Villaset number four. It's quite a light oil, really. So on the outside, the spindle's got a threaded nose, something like 40 millimeters with a 3.5 pitch and 55 degree flank angles. I made up my own adapters. I thread milled them on the CNC mill. chucks all the time, they never cease. The inside of the spindle takes Bolly standard collets. And at some stage, I turned up the spindle thread protector. 
One thing that's very cool about these old industrial lathes is that the bed is so stiff and massive really. One rule of thumb for lathe rigidity is to look for one where the bed width exceeds the center height. In this case we've got about 20 centimeters wide, 12 centimeters high. Another factor of merit kind of associated with that is how long is the bed saddle. So in this case we're up around 375 millimeters for a lathe that only has about a 400 millimeter between center distance. So you have these huge guiding waves which really help with rigidity and cutting down chatter. Being historically a watchmaking company, the quality of the dials and the engraving is really nice. Now if you compare this with a more conventional design you might be thinking there's no lead screw. But there is a lead screw, it's just Bolly's twist on the whole thing was to put the lead screw down the center underneath the bed with the half nuts and kind of a saddle mechanism which spanned both sides of the saddle. Bolly saw two advantages of this layout. One was with the lead screw and the half nuts protected from above they didn't get covered in swarf and therefore they lasted longer and didn't wear out. And the second advantage they claimed was by driving the saddle on both sides you prevented the sort of racking against any backlash and increased the accuracy. Accuracy. However that protection requires a closed bedway so you don't have any path for your swarf to fall down out of the bed and means you've got to be constantly sort of brushing it away if you're doing a bigger job. Here to engage the lead screw you just push this lever forward till it clicks and you can either disengage it by pulling the knob or you can move this ramp along the bed to automatically kick out the power feed at a set point. At low speeds, like in back gear, it can take quite a long time before the lead screw comes around to the point where it'll engage. But Bolly thoughtfully put a freewheel into the system so that you can just advance the lead screw at the same time finding the engagement position and away you go. To drive the lead screw for threading, there's the lead screw. Conventional uh, change wheels were used and the machine was supplied with a full set of them. However, by the time I got this one, the change wheels obviously got lost. This is an option from Bolly. It's belt driven up here off the spindle to a worm gear which drives change gears. And this fine feed mechanism was for ultra fine, ultra low advanced surfacing speeds for extremely high surface finishes. This feed rate placard was loose with the machine when I got it. This is the one for the fine feed mechanism. In all their marketing, Bolly seems very proud of their surface finishes, especially with diamond tooling. The only time I ever saw a full set of Bolly change wheels come up for sale was through eBay UK about 10 years ago. And unfortunately, when I contacted the guy, he had just sold the set to an artist who was going to weld them all together for an installation. Ugh. The storage compartment for the change wheels is this one down here below the electrical compartment. And what do we got there? Because I didn't see much chance of getting the original change wheels, or when I needed to thread cut, I just removed this whole module. And then this bracket clamps onto the same boss that this clamps onto. It's just an M34 stepper motor with a belt drive directly onto the lead screw. I was running just Linux CNC on a single axis. To do electronic lead screw type threading, you need a spindle encoder. So I just put this 36 tooth cogged wheel between the spindle nuts. Somewhere up in there, there's one of those little LED gates on there to pick up position. And I made up this little electronic widget which ingests the analog signal from the light gate and I think I use Schmidt triggers to output a like square wave TLL signal which you can plug into any Linux CNC mark. So basically everything's there to just do an electronic lead screw like with Stefano's DRO ELS module. I'll leave a link. I don't think this carousel carriage stop is an original Bolly component. It looks shop made to me, but it's quite handy. As is quite typical for a watch making lathe manufacturer, the quill of the tail stock is fully supported through its entire length. One thing I find kind of cute is they have this dauber. So you just put oil in here and you can drop a couple of drops of oil to keep the shaft lubricated. And the tail stock locking on the bed has a quick release on it. When I got the lathe, 
it had a second tailstock with it as well. This nice lever action one. Where the conventional tailstock has a number two Morse taper, this one is set up for the collets. Just takes the standard Bolly collets, same as the headstock, and has an integrated draw tube. Now although this is super cool, I never really had a use for it. And the one thing that's missing is the clamping mechanism. You'd have to just copy the clamping mechanism off the regular tail stock, and I never got around to doing it. Never had a need. Being a well-equipped machine, it came with the fixed steady. And it's cool, this came with this kind of asymmetric T-nut. You can just plonk that down onto the bed and crank it up and it locks in place. So you can put it on the spindle side of the saddle without removing the saddle. It sure looks like Bolly put a lot of thought into these castings and mechanisms. It's very nice. Of course, if you have a fixed steady, then you also have a traveling steady. This just bolts down. There's three standard locations for it. Once again, very nicely made. Beautiful casting. When I got it, it had this four-way tool post with it. It's quite a slick design because it's got sort of a radius floor where you put in your tools. And then you have these matching radius shims. I've only got three of the four. So this way you can do your tool height adjustment without needing a whole stack of shims. I've never been a big fan of this style of uh, four-way tool post holder. I'm not sure what happened to the original T-nut because this one doesn't fit. Whether this one came with it or, I don't know, it's definitely shop made. My preference has always been for quick change tool holders. So I got this Aloris Dorian style from phase two and I've always used that. I always found the repeatability of these wedge style tool posts to be really quite nice. And they're pretty simple geometry. So the tool holders don't cost much. But it's also good because you can get specials for this style, including things like bump knurls plus facing. That one's kind of cool. I think this one is for holding just some sort of a boring bar. Cut off. Of course, I've unloaded most of my favorite tools and moved them onto the shoblin. And this one holds a number two Morse taper. I think it's 18 all in all. The standard chuck which Bolly provided with these machines was a 110 millimeter klopfer. And I did receive it with the original external and internal clamping jaws, plus a set of soft jaws. But what bugged me was someone's turned out the original jaws for like holding stepped parts. They were just turned in enough that they were kind of annoying for holding most typical parts. So when a second, basically identical one came up, I bought it. Although it's branded Weiler, I suspect that it's also an original Klopfer. It sure seems pretty much the same. And it also came with both inside and outside jaws. But I leave this one with inside and the other one with outside jaws. The original chuck key must also be lost to time. Because this is what came with it. It works fine. The next chuck that I got was a four jaw independent. This one's from the Polish brand Bison, and I got it new old stock. Four jaw chucks can be pretty heavy, but this one's got the hollowed out body and is designed for a pretty small hub, so it's really not heavy at all. Once again, I thread milled this adapter on a Maho CNC. This chuck is my only accessory, which I'm not gonna sell with the lathe. But next up for tool holding, the face plate. This is pretty special to me because it's one of the first iron castings that I ever successfully did. I did a video on this. There should be a link somewhere up here, top right. There are some inclusions and voids in the casting, but overall, I was pretty happy with how it came out. While I was set up to thread mill the faceplate, I also made a spare adapter for another chuck, which I've never used. At the same time, I also turned up a pair of gauges, kind of go no go gauges for checking the size of any parts that I made. It's fitted with the standard Bolly collet closer. This reduces the bore down from 23 millimeters down to I think 18, but you can remove it if you need the full size spindle bore. And then there's collets. 
The G Bolly collets are kind of special because they've got kind of a weird thread on the back. I think it's something like 21.1 millimeter with a 1.1 millimeter pitch or something. I guess if you're a lathe manufacturer, you got to flex a bit. My machine came without any, so it took me a while, probably a couple of years, to sort of scrape these together. It's actually a mixture of some are imperial and some of them are metric, so you end up with some quite unusual sort of sizes that are really quite practical. You know, 19.1 for three quarter inches, use that all the time. Of course, as soon as I finished making the collet Block. I then came across some more. So there's 8.5, 10.5, 13.5, but I never got around to making a new collet block. In fact, on top of those, there's another 14. These are all duplicates. So although there are a few oddball sizes missing, with those 68 collets I've pretty much been able to cover everything I've needed. So there we have it. It's a pretty complete set of tooling I've got for the Bolly. It's been a great lathe. I've really enjoyed using it. It's a truly lovely little lathe, perfect for sort of home and hobby use, and was made back in the days when machines were built up to a standard and not down to a price. So I hope whoever buys it enjoys it as much as I have. Thanks for watching.